Hi there, gun control activist. Uh, I'm very fond of saying at some point in a conversation with a gun control activist or advocate that um, what you require is not a debate, what you need is an education. So if you happen to be a gun control advocate, listen up, I'm having a weird streak of benevolence. I'm going to give you a little bit of an education on one particular topic. Uh, and and spe uh, specifically I refer to the discussion about why it is that private citizens retain their firearms as a way of providing either a uh, deterrent to a tyrannical government or, if need be, the ability to resist a tyrannical government to which you will very often respond with something a little bit silly like, oh, well, you and your rifle, you can't stand up to the tanks and the planes and the drones and the nukes and all this other silly shit. Only gun control advocates imagine that the way the scenario is going to be, it's going to be a couple guys with a few little rifles are going to go out to a battlefield somewhere, plant a flag, challenge the American military to open combat and conventional warfare on a, on a normal battlefield, and somehow conquer them. You're the only ones who think that. So if you do think that, or that you have some picture like that, sit down, grab some popcorn, or, well, given the prodigious nature of some of your belt lines, grab some bonbons, and let's talk. A while back, Voodoo6 did a video uh, in which he was talking about your type of gun advocacy, and he gave a hand-waving gesture saying, don't worry about it, we all have ways, we have ways of dealing with all that kind of stuff. But he went into no details, and he's perfectly correct. I'm not going to go into much detail, but I'm going to give you some generalities here. The difference between um, the citizens who already live here and an invading army is that we already live here, which means that we don't have to do anything to get to where we are right now, because here we are. We have already ready access to much of the infrastructure that would need to be destroyed to cripple a conventional army. And you can, do, you can make it difficult for them in a lot of ways by interfering with the three important things to any, any uh, warfighting unit, uh, being able to shoot, move, and communicate. And I refer, refer, of course, to electricity, fuel, food, things of that nature, um, and weaponry. So, the philosophy under, undergirding the American system is that it is not wise to concentrate power in any one place. And given that that's the philosophy and it's how the government is set up, distribution of power um, uh, between three branches of the federal government, between the federal government and the states and whatnot, it's also how we distribute our, in, our infrastructure. Now, part of that's just out of necessity. If you want power here, you need a power uh, station somewhere near there. But for the important, uh, vital infrastructure, it's also distributed that way for two reasons, one of which it makes an invading army much much less likely, much less able to take it all out at once because it's distributed here and there. But that also decentralizes it, so that way the federal government can't keep all of it under their thumb at any one time. I refer here, of course, to the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. We keep that in states that have never been particularly friendly to the expansion of federal power at the cost of state power, in particular Texas, has about half of our strategic petroleum reserves, all of which is unrefined, by the way, and we also don't have much of a refining capacity. So that's kept in Texas, which is firmly on the side of states' power and states' rights when there's a contest between federal power and state power. This is not accidental, it's not happenstance. This is how the system is designed. The federal army, the federal military, I should say, to make it more broad, has a lot of really high-tech, important, powerful weaponry. The thing is, is that the federal government also has to provide that to the state militaries. Each state, the district, and the territories all have a military, fund, uh, <clears throat> which supplies are provided by the federal government, and they are equal in their capacity, if they all work together, to the federal army. Now, if just Nebraska goes off the reservation, Nebraska is going to lose. It can't possibly win. If uh, 49 states decide they want to contest the federal army, the federal army is in for... Uh, well, let's say a couple of nights at the bar with some, with some beer, it's not going to work out well for them. You have those checks and balances put into the system, and then you have, as Yamamoto, as Yamamoto, Admiral Yamamoto never actually said, the problem in America that there really is a rifle behind every blade of grass. So what is it that is different between squaring off against a conventional modern military and being an unconventional, in, embedded, guerrilla warfare type of people. Well, all of the resources, all the infrastructure, there's a built-in disincentive to a conquering army when it wants to occupy the land, in this case, the land it's already in, to, uh, there's, a, there's a disincentive for them to wage total war. Notably, what they're doing is they're cutting, if, you're, if you start waging that kind of aggressive war, you are thinning out, sure, sure, the replacements for the rebels, but you're also thinning out your very own replacements. You're, di you're disrupting and destroying vital infrastructure that your war machine requires that the rebels don't. Rebels are not as dependent on uh, hierarchies. They're not as dependent on established lines of communication, established supply lines, established fuel resources, and, and all these kinds of things. They're much more skin of their teeth 
kind of uh, units. Also, the one thing you need to factor in is in that kind of contest, the, rep the people who are resisting the tyrannical government are already desperate uh, right from the outset. So their options are, are going to be something along the lines of, look, we can either uh, die succumbing to the power or we can die resisting it. We have nothing to lose and everything to gain. We're going to do whatever it takes. And it is a war of attrition. So you start destroying fuel reserves that affect the civilian population because that's going to funnel it. That's going to start re uh, making the military reserve fuel resources for its own war fighting machine to eradicate the rebels. That starts disrupting larger infrastructure. It's a nonlinear attack. It's one one kind of resource is being attacked, but it has nonlinear ramifications in, in the society. And in a war of attrition, the more you can disrupt infrastructure, the more you hamper a conventional military. And it doesn't do a lot at all to an unconventional military, particularly one that is already understood that they're going to hang together or apart, so they might as well go out guns a-blazing. So you have that. You also have people who are going to be sympathetic to one side or another who are going to join the, the, uh, the powers that be in their imperfect positions to sabotage things. One thing to, to uh, bear in mind here, and I don't know if you watch Stargate SG-1, but there's, this, uh, there's a wonderful story arc, and it was actually my favorite, and it dealt with the Asgard and the replicators. The repli Asgard are very highly technically advanced people, but they're entirely dependent upon their technology. You weaken their technology, they're completely helpless. Conventional armies in, in the modern world are a lot like that. You start interrupting uh, the ability of, of them to get batteries. The three things they need to be able to do, shoot, move, and communicate. You start interrupting batteries, line units that are actually doing the fighting are going to have difficulty communicating. That's not going to affect unconventional units because their battle plans are decentralized. And they don't depend on uh, any communication between them to coordinate. That's not how it works. Conventional militaries require that. You have to, If you're in 1st Platoon, you need to know what 2nd Platoon is doing, and 2nd Platoon needs to know what 3rd Platoon is doing, and the company needs to know what another company needs to know, and, and so on up. You start interrupting uh, their battery packs. That limits their ability to talk on the radios that they require, uh, particularly for frequency hopping, encoded communication. So they start having to use other conventional, um, older technology that uh, either isn't, it either can't be encrypted or is more susceptible to uh, being eavesdropped on. So no biggie. Well, no, no biggie for rebels. That's useful for the rebels, but bad for the, uh, the military. So you have those things going on. You also, when, if you fly commercial, well, if you fly on anything, this is true. Uh, so next time you're in an airplane, just ponder what I'm about to tell you. One of the problems that gun control advocates is, um, they think about going to war and having more and more powerful technology uh, that's more advanced, which is, to be sure, helpful. But there's also a, a downside to it. The more technically sophisticated a piece of equipment is, the easier it is to render an operative. And the jets, whether they're bombers, fighter jets, or your passenger jet that you use to fly for vacation, have certain systems on them which can be disrupted quite easily. I'm going to talk about one particular system uh, that is used so that way the aircraft knows its height and by extension it's able to tell the, the onboard computers and the pilots something about its speed. I'm not going to tell you what the system is just in case uh, some terrorist out there happens to watch this and they don't know about it. It'll make it that much harder for them to figure out. But you can gum up that system. You can bring down a modern military aircraft or civilian aircraft with a cleverly placed piece of scotch tape. It's all it takes and it'll be put in, it's put in a place where it's very hard to detect. Mechanics won't spot it and the pilots won't spot it, notwithstanding the fact that they examine this particular system every time they, uh, before they take off to make sure that it's not gummed up. But the, if, if, when these are checked, it's checked on the proviso that the gumming up of the system would be done inadvertently, not uh, intentionally. And you can bring down pretty much any, any uh, aircraft that way, helicopter, jet, whatever. So there's that. You can, uh, the Mark 19, if you've never seen it, it's an automatic grenade launcher. It does 325 to 375 grenades per minute on its uh, cyclic rate of fire. Very, very lovely piece of machinery. Love shooting it. Uh, very durable, unless you're clever. The, one, of the, one of the things that allows uh, a, a cyclic rate that high is the tolerances and the machining of the different parts. 
and you can render one of those weapons completely inoperative. It can't be repaired on the battlefield. It can't even repair, be repaired at the armorer level. You have to go back to the manufacturer to be remachined. And you can do this with a paper clip. And it will permanently render that weapon inoperative until it's sent back to the manufacturer and remachined. So with one guy with a paper clip can be installed as an armor in some unit and, and take out hundreds of these they are going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair if you want to keep using them. And if not, you just let those be lost. Then over time, you start, you start losing more and more materiel resources by these little salami tactics of which I speak. Now, of course, these couple of things that I'm pointing out are not sufficient to do much to uh, really be victorious. But I should point out, I'm not covering the gambit of what can be done. I'm giving you very particular examples which I'm going to claim are representative of the types of things that can be done and the ease with which they can be pulled off of which there are many hundreds and thousands of different ways that these things can be done. And as Voodoo 6 said, we have ways of dealing with all these things that you imagine. And here's why he's right. In the United States we have a population of veterans that's 22 million strong. That's a little bit smaller than the entire population of Afghanistan. And if I haven't mentioned it, when we invaded in Afghanistan, they had a little under a thousand Taliban fighters. Now they have approximately 40,000 Taliban fighters, and victory is not exactly on the horizon for the United States. And look at the resources we're pouring in to fighting this thing that we're not going to have a victory over. You know, the, 20, the nearly $20 trillion debt that's upcoming. That's what's going to destroy this country. It's what destroys was well, not the only thing that destroys countries throughout his uh, nations throughout great nations throughout history, but it's one of the things that uh, does render, render them weak when they get conquered, is they exhaust their treasuries and they can't maintain the standard of living and maintain the resources that they've had, and they become prey to whoever next door has the kind of things uh, necessary to take them over. Anyway, putting that off to the side. Now, if only one percent of those veterans choose to fight on the side of the citizens as opposed to the side of the government or stay out of the way. You'll have a fighting force that is many, 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 many times stronger than all the Taliban fighters that have existed in Afghanistan throughout the American incursion and the, the, uh, the Soviet incursion of the 1980s. And neither the United States nor the Soviets has been able to successfully conquer Afghanistan. No one has. You can't conquer that place. The only way you're going to win is to level the entire country, to kill almost everyone, which is precisely the kind of strategy that even if we were inclined to do it, I mean, we have the technical resources to, to do it in Afghanistan, you couldn't do that in the United States if you want to rule the United States. One does not go dropping nuclear devices in one's own backyard for uh, the victory of some particular battle. And if you can't figure out what the disincentive there is in dropping nuclear, uh, having nuclear explosions detonating around you, then you're not very smart. It's kind of like... um. And this guy, on, this guy Concordance was talking about how grenades are not an effective means of uh, self-defense. That's not true. They're a very effective weapon. They're just very unwise to use. You have, they, will, they will serve the purpose that you want them to do. That is to say, they will kill off intruders. The problem is that to, to use it, to kill them, you too have to die. That's, it doesn't mean it's not an effective weapon. It, it's too effective. It, it's, it, it kills too well. You want something that's not quite as strong as that for personal defense. Anyway. But all of these, these uh, former military members in the United States, when they leave the United States, the knowledge they have about how the, the military works is not sucked out of their heads. They retain it. And also bear in mind that the Taliban fighters, Mujahideen, all, all these different kinds of people that uh, you hear about in the news, are not particularly well trained, notwithstanding the fact they go to terrorist training camps. A terrorist training camp is nothing like the American military. The training is not on par. So you will have in this body of this, uh, this population of veterans, people who have been tankers, people who have been pilots, people who have done crypto, people who have done this, people who have done that. They will know of necessity the very ways to destroy the infrastructure that these things depend on and the weapons and vehicle platforms themselves. And the reason for that is when you get into the military, one of the things that you spend a lot of time uh, being trained on is how to defend against your own weaknesses. So you have to know what they are in order to successfully defend against them, d defend attacks against them. Well, 
those people who have left know what the weaknesses are. They know what the countermeasures to those weaknesses are. That gives them a leg up in making countermeasures to the countermeasures that are compensating for that weakness. One of which is, by the way, devoting resources to compensate for a weakness also detracts the weak, uh, that, that power from your actual strong points. People who serve in the military aren't stupid. They know how to fight wars. People who got out of the military and used to fight wars still know how to do that. More particularly, they know that the United States military is not very good at doing urban combat even less well. Uh, it will do even less well in urban combat in the United States for some of the reasons I pointed out and some others. And also, um, when you say that uh, there won't, there's not a deterrent effect, that's simply not the case. There, there is a deterrent effect for any government that has to fight an armed citizenry. And the way that you know this is simply by looking at what tyrants always do whenever they get ready to start having their pogroms or their, uh, their genocides or whatever. They want to disarm the very people they, they um, intend on killing. And they realize that even though those people won't be able to conquer them, say like Warsaw Ghetto, uh, a couple of people taking a city and resisting your forces is an inconvenience that can fuck up your entire war effort. You have to start devoting uh, a lot of unnecessary resources to deal with just a couple of hundred people. And the only way, by the way, Hitler was able to win in the Warsaw Ghetto was to just do total war and flatten the whole fucking place and kill everybody. Well, a couple people, a few people survived. Anyway, that's not a strategy that you can use many times in, on your own land, because before long, you're going to have nothing but a vacant landscape, a flattened landscape, and no more resources and no more bodies, no more slaves to throw into the camps to do, to do the work for you. Putting, putting that off to the side. <clears throat> Another thing is that if you were right, Every, okay, periodically, and I'm going to choose my words here carefully, from time to time, at every installation in the United States and overseas, CONUS and OCONUS, there will be something done that's called a vulnerability assessment, which is generally, um, the final form of it is, is classified. And the reason being is because the vulnerability assessment is how they go around and figure out what all the weak points are uh, to each installation and each nexus of installations. Different installations in a region will have different responsibilities individually and as a group they'll have different uh, areas that they're re overall responsible for. So you learn what the weaknesses are at each individual base, you put that in a document that you classify because you don't want to hand that to your enemy, and you look at the infrastructure uh, of, of groups of installations that cover some particular region and you know what where because this this group here has some particular deficiency uh, that it can't do as well at this thing as it's supposed to, so now this base has to cover for it, which means it's being weakened over somewhere else where it was stronger, uh, Not if, if only it weren't for this weakness at this one base. And anyway, these reports, as I mentioned, are classified for all the obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> and in there you'll have just simple physical security type stuff. Where are the munitions kept? How is the site, uh, how is the site hardened at a munition, munitions facility to make sure uh, the sabotage is harder to pull off, how are your communications, all these kinds of things. And none of these can guard against, however, it, people working behind the scenes with ill intent. That is something that you just can't get around. Now, hell, even in World War II, <laughs> the Germans were able, able to, uh, at the Battle of the Bulge, infiltrate behind our lines by having people they'd been training to speak English perfectly. Uh, speak American perfectly, I should say, get uniforms and just walk in and join our ranks as part of us and start sabotaging our shit. It took a while before they caught on. It's going to be even harder if the people uh, already know the weapon systems inside and out and know how to attack them in a way that it's not going to be obvious that they've been sabotaged. And take the M4 carbine or the AR-15, the M16, whatever you want to call it. This, the, the, the shooting mechanism is kind of the same. So when a soldier field strips it, they only break it down so far to keep it cleaned. And one step above them is the armorer, the, the person who actually uh, keeps the weapons for the unit. They will know how to repair those weapons or main, uh, handle maintenance at a, at a higher level so they can deal with smaller and smaller parts. But there are parts that go in that, that uh, firing mechanism that are even too sensitive for the armorers to be able to do uh, in the arms rooms. They have to send it back up to some, I don't remember what it's called now, some higher level where they have much, much better parts. All you have to do, if you go to an entire arms room, you can walk out with a couple of ounces of metal and all those weapons will eventually be rendered inoperative. You just take out, it's a very tiny, tiny pen, and if you're not looking for it uh, ex expressly, you're not going to notice it. And that's very important for the uh, continued cyclic rate of fire. You take that out, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fail fairly quickly. And, I mean, obviously, if you're sitting there and, you know, you're leading a battle and suddenly you realize that none of your troops are shooting, you're going to go, hey, uh, hmm.
Did we... Did somebody load blanks today? Did we... Do we have the rubber duckies? The plastic training weapons are called rubber duckies, which, by the way, are heavier than the real things. Not real ducks, but the real weapons. Did we get rubber duckies today? No. These are, these are live. Why isn't anybody shooting? And the time you find that out is going to be highly inconvenient because you can't repair it. You're just there with a bunch of soldiers holding, well, what are the equivalent of rubber duckies, only lighter. They're completely useless. And all you've done is walk out with a couple of ounces of metal. And you've, you can leave an entire company uh, pretty much defenseless, although they'll have to have their saws and whatnot. All these kinds of things. People who've been in the military know what these weaknesses are. They know that they're there. Um, the people who look at our base defense... Um, posture, our defense posture, our, well, our, our defense posture, both CONUS and OCONUS, know what these weaknesses are. They spend a lot of money examining these weaknesses because <laughs> they're the kinds of things that can cripple entire la large swaths of the American military or any other military. The reason the German soldiers that came over in the Battle of the Bulge didn't uh, do so well at actually uh, wreaking much havoc is they didn't think low-tech. They thought high-tech. They wanted to go after uh, the, the big war-fighting things, like the tanks and whatnot. That's not where you're going to win. And by the way, even the Abrams can be taken out, and some of them have been uh, rendered inoperative by simple machine gun fire. It just has to be very, very, very well-placed. Anyway, you no occupying force can continue an occupation by using tanks. You have to send in troops. No occupying force can occupy land with just air cover and tanks. You have to, at the bottom, there's always a person who's operating it somewhere, even these remote drones. It's true. Drones are problematic. One of the things that uh, makes them so useful is that they're remote operated. That makes them useful to use elsewhere, not particularly useful to use here. Because unlike going there, wherever there is defined that's not here, the people you're shooting at don't have access to your pilots. American citizens do. These people, they walk among us. And, just as importantly, their family members walk among us. And if you don't think that start the, the assassination of these people's family members won't make them th uh, have second thoughts about dropping the next bomb in downtown Iowa, you have another thing coming. We can, so, in other words, if it ever devolves to this, and hopefully it never will, it's part of the design of the systems that you don't have to, it keeps people happy enough to get along, but for hypothetical purposes, if it does devolve to that, you have all these things to factor in, all of which are within the hands of an unconventional army, and a conventional army is all but powerless to prevent it, because they're non-linear, they have non-linear ramifications throughout the force. One person in one arms room that renders an entire company useless, has done a tremendous amount of damage, far more than uh, taking out one tank or one drone. You now have hundreds of troops who cannot fight, because one guy was clever. And it is this that, contrary to what these gun control advocates say, actually does frighten military planners, because they understand that the system is no better than its weakest part. And the more high-tech it goes, the, the uh, wider the ramifications are of a failure in, one, in any one particular spot, and the easier it is to sabotage it once you're already in the system. And I hasten to add, the people that are going to be being recruited by the, the, putative, uh, the hypothetical tyrant in this are going to come from the population who are related to the people he's been killing. And that is always problematic. Have a great day.